Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again today for episode 3 of 5 in our series on telescopes. Make sure you stick around for all five of those, subscribe so you get them all. So far we've talked about how telescopes work and who invented them and how they used them when they first figured out what they were doing. But today we're going to talk a bit more about how telescopes have come away from being used just by eyeballs and now we can use them for all sorts of crazy stuff. We're also going to get into later how telescopes have been used to discover all sorts of things and some really out there stuff. No pun intended, on telescopes. As we've learned from our other series earlier on light, make sure to check that out if you haven't, the amount of the electromagnetic spectrum that humans perceive is actually really small. So when it comes to telescopes, why would we only look at that little sliver of visible light? We've got all this huge amount of spectrum to use, so why don't we create, instead of images and pictures for humans, why don't we create spectra? These are captured chunks of the electromagnetic spectrum through a telescope. If you haven't seen our series on light, you kind of need to understand how the EM spectrum works. The electromagnetic spectrum is a range of all known electromagnetic radiation, everything from X-rays and gamma rays and things like that, all the way to radio waves and even infrared heat that is coming off of your body right now is radiation on the electromagnetic spectrum. If you feel the warmth of your own hand, that's infrared radiation. So think of the electromagnetic radiation as a stream of waves of photons traveling the speed of light. The amount of energy those photons contain or are carrying with them helps place them on the electromagnetic scale based on the size of their waves. So tiny little waves like gamma waves or really big waves like radio waves. The energy of the electromagnetic radiation in those photons is measured in waves and the length of those waves determine its place like I just said, but they're in constant motion so we can't directly measure them, but we can pick up the energy that they're imparting upon our detectors. I mean, I can't measure them regardless, but scientists totally can. The lowest energy waves are those radio waves. The highest energy are things like gamma, but there's also infrared, microwave, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, all sorts of stuff all in the middle. Again, if you haven't seen our episodes on light, if you haven't checked out our series on light, go do that, because it's really awesome. So, back to telescopes. Our atmosphere reflects and absorbs a lot of electromagnetic radiation that flies through space. I mean, the sun is giving off electromagnetic radiation across the bands of all of the different types all the time. When we look through a regular reflecting, refracting, you know, a telescope of any kind, we would see visible light. There's so much electromagnetic radiation in the universe, though, the visible light spectrum isn't that useful. So. We're going to start with the radio telescope, the lowest energy wave. Radio telescopes are not necessarily out in space. They don't necessarily have to be out there because radio waves can penetrate Earth's atmosphere. However, radio waves are extremely faint. They're very low powered. According to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory website, a cell phone signal coming out of your cell phone is a billion, billion times more powerful than a cosmic wave for some radio telescope to detect. I mean, a billion, billion. That's a lot. You've seen pictures or videos of these big old dishes out in the desert or something. Those are radio telescopes. They come in a variety of different shapes and sizes, depending on what type of radio wave they're trying to pick up. And all radio telescopes have an antenna on a mount and at least one piece of receiver equipment that will detect that radio wave. So think of it like your satellite dish if you have satellite TV. That is sort of like a radio telescope, but it's only picking up a very small frequency. Radio waves are very faint, so that's why radio telescopes have to be really, really big. Being large helps those telescopes get a clearer picture of what they're looking at. Because the bigger the antenna, the more it helps drown out the noise of Earth-based AM, FM radio, cell phones, Wi-Fi, which all use a very similar radio band. So like normal telescopes though, radio telescopes reflect EM radiation. In the case of a reflecting telescope that you can put your eyeball to, it's only reflecting visible light. But in this case, we're reflecting radio waves. It reflects them off the dish and toward the receiver. All of the wavelengths are bounced up into that receiver and then they are picked up and processed. That little thing on the top of the arm of a satellite dish, if you picture that in your mind, it's called a feed horn. The feed horn collects the bounced waves. They make it easy so that only a specific wavelength gets transported into your instruments that you're trying to analyze. The feed horns can be located above the dish at a focal point, but they can also be in different places. You could put a mirror on that arm and reflect 
those waves somewhere else. Essentially, it depends on what you're trying to collect and how you want to collect them. The dish surface, though, regardless of what you're collecting, is extremely important because you have to make that big dish, but it all has to be so precise because the waves have to reflect just so or you miss your data, right? So you can't have them warped, you can't have them dinged, they need to be just so. You can actually combine radio telescopes. So a radio telescope is fine on its own. You can pick up stuff that way. But if you took two radio telescopes or three and made a triangle, now you can network them together and create an array of telescopes that are all picking up radio waves. Now if you do that again and again and again and again, you get so many telescopes, but they all function as one big array of telescopes. A really good example of this is the VLA in New Mexico, the Very Large Array. You've likely seen video of this, of a bunch of satellite dishes all moving together in fast motion, right? This actually is an innovation that won a Nobel Prize in physics, and I don't want to get into exactly how the VLA works. It's really, really complicated. Let us know in the comments or on Twitter if you want to know more. But the further those radio telescopes are apart, the bigger the telescope they can make. This is called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, or VLBI. You might remember that from our Black Holes series where we had Ian O'Neill in, speaking of black holes, Talk about gravitational waves, completely separate from EM radiation, but it's cool. That news came out today, the day we're recording this. So that's radio telescopes, and that's just one band. But there are all these different bands, and they all tell you different things about the universe. Next is the infrared telescope. This is one of my favorites. It's really, really cool. Water vapor in the atmosphere absorbs a lot of infrared radiation from Earth's surface, but some infrared wavelengths can be observed from the surface. But you can also put space telescopes up above the atmosphere, and then they can absorb infrared radiation directly from the universe around us. They could also put them on top of mountains to get them close to that, like Mauna Kea in Hawaii. The design of an infrared telescope is essentially the same as a radio telescope, and if you are kind of getting the theme here, a visible light telescope, because they're all electromagnetic radiation collectors. A combination of mirrors gathers and focuses the electromagnetic radiation. Instead of getting radio, though, and instead of getting visible light, it's getting infrared waves. The difference is your eyeball can't see infrared waves. It can't see radio waves. So you're not putting it into an eyepiece, you're putting it into a computer. The computer then translates it into data that we can use to make inferences about the universe. The main difference here is a detector for like an infrared telescope might be a superconducting alloy like mercury cadmium telluride. And radio telescopes and infrared have something else in common, interference. If you have a FM radio station near a radio telescope, you're going to have to block out that frequency all the time and hope that you don't want to see something on that frequency. A cloud getting in the way of a visible light telescope really sucks. Well, having a radio station near a radio telescope, that's the equivalent of a cloud blocking that part of your view, right? Infrared can have that problem as well. Heat sources like the Earth itself or other things could skew the readings and make it difficult to see anything. To make sure those heat sources don't skew the readings, detectors are often cooled because computers, if you've ever used one, get hot. Hot things are giving off infrared radiation so they can mess up the detection, so they'll cool the detectors down to almost absolute zero, which is insane. But that way they can be really, really, really sensitive and pick up things really, really, really low energy. So radio telescopes, infrared telescopes, you've got visible light telescopes, that's where we live and we spend all our time. The Hubble telescope is a visible light telescope. It's why it's one of the most famous. Even though there are a bunch of space telescopes out there, we love the Hubble because we can see what it takes pictures of and it makes sense to our you know, little brains. But what about X-ray telescopes? These are really cool because X-rays aren't reflected by mirrors particularly easily, right? They go right through most matter. Technically, if you just popped a mirror in front of an X-ray, nothing would happen. So you have to use mirrors in a specific way and heavy mirrors, things that are made of gold, things that are made of nickel, iridium, or metals that are nice and dense that X-rays can bounce off of. And you're not bouncing them directly so much as kind of angling the mirrors slightly so you're doing something called a grazing incidence. It's almost parallel to the x-ray that you're getting because it bends the x-ray toward your focal point so that you can get 
all of the information that you need. It's sort of like, think of the x-ray as the stone and the mirrors are the lake and the x-ray is skipping from one mirror to the next until it gets to your focal point. If you add more mirrors and more and more layers of mirrors, you're gonna get more x-rays and you're gonna get more information. Last but not least, we have gamma ray telescopes. Gamma rays are even more energetic, as they say in physics, than x-rays. And there is no way to prevent a gamma ray from passing through a reflecting mirror. They just go through it. They don't care that there is matter in the way because they're so high energy. So instead of using a physical object, we have to use detectors. When a gamma ray hits something, they create a little optical flash because it creates a pair of particles, an electron and a positron. So what we do is when we wanna spot a gamma ray, we set up a detection system that can spot that little positron and a little electron and we're like, oh, gamma ray right there. So it sort of bypasses the whole reflection thing and secondary mirrors and of course there's no way you can do eyepieces. But when you do that and you spot those little pairs, you can see what was there. So anyway, that is a lot on telescopes and how they work. And now I'm sure you're wondering, now that you know how they all work, what's the difference? Why do we wanna see gamma rays, x-rays, visible light, infrared, or radio? What do they show that's different, right? Come back tomorrow to find out about that. And also, uh, before we go, we're doing this whole series because coming up on February 20th on Discovery Channel, it's a Saturday, is the global premiere of Telescope. It's all about the James Webb Space Telescope. We're gonna get to it. We're gonna talk about it later in this series too, but make sure you put that on your calendar. 9 p.m. February 20th, tune in. It's gonna be really awesome. Telescopes are cool. Make sure you subscribe and come back tomorrow for more Test Tube Plus. Do you have a favorite type of telescope? I know you just learned about all these, but which one of those piques your interest the most? Tell us in the comments. Come find me on Twitter, at Trace Dominguez. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.